Hello and welcome to the video podcast Bridging Voices of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Brussels. My name is Kim Ti Tong and I am with my dialogue partners um, from today, member of the International Adenauer Network. The International Adenauer Network brings together young and highly motivated politicians from Europe, Latin America, Asia, Africa and the Middle East. And our goal is to build a platform where we can share different perspectives and where we can also discuss about political issues and in consequence, possible policy instruments um, and solutions. Before I start, I would like to thank the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation here in Brussels for giving us the opportunity to talk about a really important um, topic when it comes to the representation and also participation um, of women in the political field. Our topic today is women in their growing role in political parties a topic that exists for a very long time already. And after all those years, it is still there and evidently still a challenge for parties and um, political bodies. For this debate, I would like to introduce um, our listeners to my fellow members of the International Adenauer Network. We have Jagalan Vataya from Mongolia. Welcome. Um, Flo uh, Florencia as well as uh, Bacaro from Ag Argentina and Aya Chiari from Tunisia. Thank Happy uh, to have you here. Thanks. Um, let me start with you, Jaglan. You may have heard that the Christian Democratic Party in Germany has recently obliged its um, executive boards mm -hmm. um, on every level to implement a temporary quota for women, starting with a minimum of 30% this year increasing to 40% um, in two years and to 50% women represented in the executive boards um, in two th uh, 2025. Mm -hmm. And um, I can assure you um, this, I call it an achievement, uh, took us quite a long while in Germany. So Jaglan, you are a member of the Democratic Party of Mongolia and the vice chair of the Democratic Women's U Union. Um, within your party. How is the situation in Mongolia um, for women in politics and what causes especially you to be engaged um, in the women's wing? Mm -hmm. um, maybe some people may say maybe for political position <laughs> or uh, what, yeah, what was the reason for you? Um, thank you very much, Kim Ti, for hosting this uh, podcast and thanks for having us uh, discussing this very important topic, topic obviously. Um, first of all, I would like to start with the general situation in Mongolia. Compared to some um, other countries, Mongolia has been relatively um, egalitarian in terms of uh, the position of women in society in general. We were actually, in fact, one of the first countries in the world, uh, uh, d definitely the first country in Asia to um, uh, give a voting right to women. That happened in 1924. And so far, um, the role of women uh, in society participating in all different sectors um, has been very high. And people perceive Mongolia as being a relatively egalitarian society in those terms with a relatively little gender bias. Having said that, um, I would like to also mention the percentage of women represented in parliament. We have 17% women in parliament, which is below the global average of 21%. Um, and um, so our goal right now is to make sure that more women are represented at a politically high posts within the government, within uh, the parliament, within political parties. And with that introduction, I go back to my own party, the Democratic Party of Mongolia, and what are we doing in that respect, right? We want more women in high political posts. And political parties are obviously gatekeepers you know, to political life, you know, political parties nominate uh, candidates for parliament, um, they form the government. So um, what kind of rules political parties uh, go by uh, within the intra-party democracy uh, are very important for women's representation. And that's where um, um, rules like, you know, gender quotas come in. In fact, we had a similar... Um, development um, back in 2017 when we introduced women-only seats in the National Policy Committee, 
which is the governing body of our party. And so we had a, um, a, a, a seat only for women. So it was a, gen- a gender quota, basically. And um, I think it uh, went quite successful. You know, we have uh, many women represented in almost every district. And we have uh, a relatively high representation of women in the governing bodies, but it's still not enough. So right now, uh, we're also talking about and lobbying and advocating for legislation at national level, perhaps in, uh, increasing uh, women's quotas um, in the election laws. Currently, we have a gender quota in the election law, which is 20%, and uh, but 20% is not enough, obviously. And sometimes, you know, gender quotas like that become the minimum. Uh, well, it, they're supposed to be the minimum, but they become the maximum. It's like, oh, the law says that you have to nominate 20% women. So we nominate 20% women. No, but this is the minimum. You know, this is the floor. And sometimes it becomes the glass ceiling that we can't break. So uh, we're advocating for um, a national um, legislation to introduce quotas in the election law itself, which uh, brings this uh, minimum to 40%, for instance. I would say that uh, quotas and instruments like this have, um, like, a, have a mixed kind of success rate. Sometimes, you know, as I said before, it becomes the minimum, and you know, it kind of curtails women's participation even more. But I think parties can do um, a lot of things in order to bring more participation of women. You know, like, and quotas are only the uh, most bare, basic thing. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, thank you, Jagalan. Um, I think one argument that we also hear very often is um, that we have, for example, a gender quota with 50%, but then we only have 20, 21 or 25 percent of women being engaged in the party. So there's an argument that this also causes kind of injustice, right? Like mm-hmm. um, giving the minority in the party more seats um, mm-hmm. compared to the other group. Um, what's the number, uh, what's the percentage of women as members of CDU, for example? So um, members, um, I think it's around 26. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I need to look, uh, look it up again. But then also in parliament, um, in the parliamentary group of the CDU, um, we have 25% women. And in the parliament in general, 35%. So even in parliament, it's, it's um, definitely not in the position where we can say we have we have a gender equality there. But having this been said, maybe one question. Um, so what do you do in your party to actually attract women to become member of the parties? Because this is also, we can talk about quotas a lot, but in the end we need um, more women in parties so that they can actually um, go for positions and fight for their ideas, right? I would say um, there are different challenges in different countries, right? Uh, in our case... Um, the membership is almost equal. So it's like about 50% women, 50% men. But when it comes to high positions, the number of women goes down. So that's why we introduce quotas and mechanisms like that to make sure that women who are active members, who are engaged with the party, can have, um, can actually uh, get elected to internal party posts. But then um, if you have like a low membership rate of women, that's an entirely different challenge, right? I mean, you're, uh, you should be working on um, attracting and maybe making the party a more welcoming place for women. And I would say that um, women's wings uh, actually do play that role uh, because, you know, from, for people coming in from outside the party, you know, who are new to political life, sometimes women's wings, youth uh, wings can be... Uh, a more welcoming place, you know, where you have uh, the same issues, when you, you have common topics, you know, before you move on to that more, um, a different level of political involvement. Thank you. Um, Flo, um, you are the former International Relations Secretary of the Youth Branch um, of PRO in Argentina. Is there a women's wing in your party and are you, like yourself, engaged in the organizational structure of it? Um, what are your thoughts um, of the idea um, women representing women? And do you think, um, like, are we always really always on the same page as women? 
Well, Kim, uh, thank you so much for your questions. Um, actually, no. Um, the answer is it's yes first and no. Uh, yes, there is a branch of women in the party in Pro. Uh, no, I never engage uh, with that branch. Um, and also regarding um, your questions, I, I did want to say some numbers about how um, women in politics and women participating in the political lives are in Argentina. So according to some numbers, uh, not only from, uh, I'm not talking only about women participating in, in my party, but in the political landscape in, in Argentina. In 2010, in 2010 we have uh, an Eight and nineteen percentage of women participating in in politics. Uh, in twenty twenty, ten years after, we only have six percent more. So it's going down. No, no, no. Nineteen, oh. twenty five. So six okay. percent more. Yeah. Uh, so twenty five percent. Of course, we acknowledge uh, getting more women into politics. It's a long career. <laughs> you know, uh, it's not uh, it's not an easy thing. But we do need to have more affirmative actions taken more uh, in order to get more women into the political life. Um, a good thing about Argentina is that we have a parity law so in terms of the legislative, so in all the lists that are presented for the national um, legislative um, branch, we do have one man, one woman, one man, one woman. So that gives us that our national congress is almost parity. So we have almost 40%, 45% in the uh, deputies chamber and in the Senate. And currently we have a president both in the Senate and in the um, deputies chamber. So good things also we need to acknowledge that are happening in terms of women's participation in the political uh, landscape. However, I have to say also regarding your question that um, sometimes, and this is of course a personal opinion, um, sometimes um, a lot of women that uh, do have an important or do play an important role, uh, they do not represent the the whole landscape on uh, women that are participating into politics. Mm -hmm. And I think this 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 is also an issue that is happening in conservative parties that sometimes. Um, people like me or women like me, that we do have a more progressive view in terms of social uh, policies or social issues are not represented in, in the bigger spheres. Sometimes we do, uh, but not always. So I think that's also uh, a debate that we should have as conservative parties um, to, to be able to represent all the different views you have in the in the women's uh, in other women's that are taking part of the of the political party. So, okay, um, can you give an example, for example, for for um, policy that where you where you would say um, women that are engaged in conservative parties um, don't really have you know in mind when it comes to the public opinion or public needs. Well, I think the quota, the quota discussion, uh, we had a lot of our deputies that uh, were advocates, advocating for parity, but not all of them. And I also wanted to say that um, abortion was another one, mm -hmm. uh, of course. Uh, I mean, I celebrate the diversity, and we do have a very diverse view uh, in terms of social uh, policies, and I, I really celebrate that. But sometimes some of the issues that are maybe um, discussed in an institutional level uh, may sometimes represent more one view than another one. Uh, I think that is also changing <laughs> due to a, a lot of these women raising their voices, really brave women. Uh, but I think it's something that we need to discuss it and need to take uh, active measures in order to be able to really have a very diverse voice in, in all the issues. I see, so of course, um, women doesn't only you know represent the same ideas and opinions. Of course, we, we often forget that when it comes to this. Of course, um, we are all diverse still, but um, there are, as we could see, um, the average of women representing um, um, the people in parliament is. is something around 20-25%, right? So uh, it's 
also kind of average from the numbers that we just heard from Jagalan. So um, you, uh, Flor, you, you also work and participate in a very male-dominated um, sector, such as security and tech. Um, what makes it so difficult for women to enter these kind of fields, um, in your opinion? That's, uh, I don't have the, um, an answer for that, because sometimes I don't quite understand what is, why it's so difficult, because when you look at history, for example, in the tech industry, when you see the first uh, programmers were actually women. So we need to analyze why we uh, are behind in that, in that career. I think that one of the things that we should analyze is regulations. For example, when it comes to maternity and paternity license, We were actually talking about that yesterday with Jargalan and Mira and other uh, of our colleagues. And uh, I personally believe that we, um, as women, uh, or as, uh, also as mother, parents, uh, uh, and also men that uh, can uh, have kids, um, we do need to have the same license. Because if not, that leaves w women in a, in a step back. Uh, let's put an example. This may not happen in big companies that have a big budget, but let's take a small company that has a, a very limited budget. Uh, who do you think if you have two candidates for a same job with the same qualifications? Both of them are in their 30s. Both of them are married. Who do you think a company will have more benefits on hiring? Of course, the men. Because in those countries that women have more uh, months on maternity leave, that will be um, a burden for the company because they will have to pay, of course, that woman the maternity leave and they won't have a person working. So how do you fix that? It's not by taking away maternity leave. It's by making maternity and paternity leave the same. That, that's uh, uh, my opinion on things that we can do to start balancing <laughs> a table that it's not balanced. Um, so also um, having more women in, in places where you take the decisions that would affect the, the population. I mean, if you don't have women that n they know a specific situation that will affect women, then the men that are drafting those policies, it's not that they won't uh, include them those topics because they don't want to. Maybe they don't know. So you need representation. And that's why I really agree with um, also another thing to, to, to put on the table that representation matters. If you're a young kid and you only see the CEOs of the big tech companies that are all male, when you see that entrepreneurs are <laughs> mostly men, when you see that the most, uh, like the old country leaders, I when you see a photo for the UN of the EU, you see most men, then you don't see yourself represented there. So it's crucial that we have more women on those positions in order also to foster and encourage girls that are developing, that are choosing a university degree to see, hey, if she could make it, I could make it. I see, so representation also as a mean for participation, Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Aya, um, you have worked as an advisor to the Minister of Agriculture, being in charge for the relations between the Parliament and the civil society. And um, you have recently become a mother of two beautiful twins uh, this year. So Aya, um, now with this, com you are combining uh, so many roads in life. Being a mother and being a political engaged person, you are such a great role model also for many women, um, if I may say. Um, but this, again, being said, isn't it strange that the reconciliation of family and work uh, life always becomes a topic um, when it concerns women? And can you give us maybe some insights of, um, yeah, of your life and of you being a female political leader um, in Tunisia? Yeah, thank you, Kim. I'm lucky to have uh, a supportive uh, husband and family, uh, but uh, this is also the case of, uh, of men who go into politics. Uh, but I've unfortunately, um, not all women uh, have a supportive family. Um, the problem is that a part of uh, the Tunisian society does not think that uh, the role of uh, women is in the public space. 
And uh, to change uh, this uh, retrograde uh, mentality, um, the law can do it uh, by uh, imposing the quota system. You know, in Tunisia, um, we m- in Tunisia, uh, the Tunisian women enjoy um, the most extensive uh, rights and achievements um, in the Arab world. For the first time uh, in the history of my country and uh, the Arab world, we have uh, a woman uh, head of government, um, Mrs. Najla Boudin. In our previous uh, parliament, where the electoral law had imposed parity, we had 68 women and uh, 149 men. Uh, women represent uh, 31%. With the current, uh, current uh, electoral law, Tunisians uh, will now have uh, to elect their deputies individually. The system of voting on electoral lists submitted by political parties has been cancelled. This change will contribute to weakening the role of political parties and reducing the presence of women in electoral assemblies. Mm. I think Tunisian uh, civil society should continue to fight for uh, women's political presence and uh, why not to expand, uh, expand it uh, to a greater presence uh, in politics. Thank you, Aya. <coughs> Thank you all for your uh, insights. It's sad uh, to see that there are still a lot of um, need, to, like there's still a lot of things to be that, that need to be done, right, to stre- strengthen the representation and participation of women in politics. But then again, it is also very encouraging um, to see that we, we are internationally also all in this uh, very nerve-wracking and um, history-changing, but history-changing um, struggle together. So thank you, um, thank you for being um, yeah for being here with me today. Thank you for listening, and let's keep in touch. <laughs>